Hi, in today's episode we have Danish Hussain. Danish is an actor, poet, theatre director. Danish has revived Dastan Goi, the lost art of Urdu storytelling and uses diverse mediums to connect with the audience. Now of course Danish has got Kisse Bazi and we will ask him about the genesis of Kisse Bazi but before that let's welcome Danish Hussain on today's podcast. Hi Danish. Hi, hi Mawa. Thank you for getting me on this podcast. It's an absolute honor to have somebody with your kind of body of work that you've done and you're an absolute inspiration for whoever will be listening and all my listeners who are spread all across and you need to tell me what is what was most amazing about you is this that you've constantly reinvented yourself and uh, you know it's such a challenge uh, when you reinvent yourself because you know it's it's fun but it's also very challenging because as an artist we are searching for validity we are searching for a sense of identity how and what was the reason that you kept reinventing yourself and where did it lead you i hope uh, i hope your listeners find it interesting i, I guess i had no choice mova okay why do I you mean, say that i i invariably found myself in a spot from where i had to reinvent myself i think uh, you know um, an artist really is on a journey like a flowing river and uh, you can't be contained you have to flow you know you have to basically move on till you finally go and meet the ocean so i think um, it's really I, i just found myself in in places and spots where i had to reinvent it was like you hit a cul de sac and uh, you have to reverse and get yourself back on the road you know you can't be stuck in the cul de sac so it was really that uh, and otherwise um, also i i think uh, the kind of age we live in it's uh, memory is short things are fast paced technology makes everything obsolete uh, very soon you know you're holding a phone six months later you have a new version of that uh, so everything is reinventing at a very Rapidly. fast pace yeah yes and um, and i think uh, that also goes for who we are you know so i think it is important for artists to be relevant and and i think uh, most of the artists uh, who are not able to kind of adapt acquire learn more things constantly be on their feet they might be having they might have had their glory but then they soon become irrelevant i think being relevant is very important uh because at the end of the day there is an audience and you are performing for an audience you are creating for an audience and if your audience is moving at a fast pace and you are not keeping up with them then you will become very irrelevant the thing is this that if i have to tell you something you should be interested in the first place to hear it if you're not interested in hearing then no matter what i want to say it doesn't matter it becomes irrelevant so danish you know i was reading about the uh, an article and uh, i was doing a little bit of research about you and uh, there was in 2014 that you had gone through a darkness phase and you know darkness is a very all encompassing feeling you know mujhe to it feels like marble jaisa lagta hai you know ki alag alag shades mein hote hain aur you know we keep we emerge uh, differently after darkness that is uh, but it's viewed you know as an all encompassing sadness uh, but to me of course it's like the birth of my art i mean i think uh, whenever i've been um, challenged and there's been grief i think um, good work has come out and honest work has come out from the angst you know and artists from all over will always agree with that so do you agree um, that darkness plays a huge role in the life of many many artists I remember once I was having a conversation with my mother. My mom was a Persian scholar and a poet. And uh, I think I asked her as to why is it that a lot of uh, good poetry or great literature is tragic or sad. And she said that uh, we are at our most vulnerable when we are sad. and when you are very vulnerable 
there is also the time when your heart is receiving a lot, is willing to receive a lot. You're more open, you're more susceptible to newer things. And I think an artist likes being in this kind of a situation where you are in a state of vulnerability and receiving things, which reminds me of another incident when I was preparing a, a musical performance with Vidya Shah on Bega Bakhtar. And I was doing my research on Bega Bakhtar. Uh, there was this funny anecdote which said that Bega Bakhtar often would thrive on, on sadness. And if she would find that everything is uh, going well in her life and there is no sadness, she would instigate a fight with a friend so that the relationship goes sour for a, for a, for a few days and, and then she could be sad <laughs> about that. And that would help her with her music. Uh, and that uh, in some way linked to what my mother said, uh, that you know you are vulnerable when you are sad and a state of vulnerability is also the state when you are willing to receive and you are and you're open to to newer things. So I think, um, what was your question, Mawa? I've forgotten that. I've gone on a trail. Doesn't matter. That's how it should be in a podcast. You know, we're just sitting opposite each other and talking to each other. And in spite of the distance, I can just, you know, through your voice, I can see you. And I'm talking about how how do you, you know, how would you define Oh, yeah. You this? asked me about that 2014 question. 2014 question. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. yes. I, I, so, I think... Um, I don't know. I mean, I, I don't really think too much about myself. So there is really no ready answer as to what do I do when I'm sad or... Do you enjoy sadness? No, not really. Okay. I'm a very gregarious, uh, um, fun kind of a person. Yeah, I like there teasing is, people a lot. Yeah, there is this uh, gregarious, fun person. But is there a part where you actually sit down and you're quiet and you look back and you reflect back and... Those moments also are very, very precious, I would believe, for a lot of people who are intense. And uh, so do you have those moments, uh, Danish? Well, by the time you reach my age, you've had all kinds of moments in your life. Why do you say that? Well, when you've lived half a century, then you really have experienced a lot in your life. Okay. And what are the ones that you remember the most? <laughs> all, all sorts of moments, Mawa. Okay. So um, to say that I've not experienced anything is really not a correct claim because by the time you hit 50, you kind of experience more or less a lot of stuff, almost every stuff that you can. Somehow I, I found myself always as a person who is not willing to go down, who doesn't want to go down, who would not let himself go down. Wonderful. I, I always, uh, yeah, I'll be like the last man standing but I will fight. I'll keep fighting. I'm not willing to give up. So uh, in some sense, despair doesn't really happen with me. Okay. I can recall moments of despair in my life, uh, but then it's not there. It can't pull me down for long. I mean, I remember when I resigned from the bank at the age of 32 and became an actor. And then first three years, nothing really was happening some odd performance here, some odd performance there. And you know how theater is. It's We really don't have much professional theater which can sustain you. So it's really amateur yes, theater. It is, yeah. There was a point when, you know, after three years, I was thinking, where now? It's not heading anywhere. I don't have a game plan and it's not heading anywhere. Am I kind of condemned to this kind of a life forever? And I reflected on it and I said, no, I'm not condemned to a life like this. If I don't like this life, I need to change it, which was the decision I took when I resigned from my job. So I changed it again. Were you scared when you quit your banking job because that would have been a completely regular income coming no, in? No, I was not scared. I was frustrated. <laughs> Okay. What did you do the first day when you quit? Did you feel that sense of relief? And what did you do? If you Do you still remember that? No, not really. Because uh, it was a process. When I resigned, my boss was not willing to believe that I want to be an actor. So he just sat over my resignation letter for two weeks. Um, and he thought I'm going to some rival bank and I'm not disclosing <laughs> it. And he kept saying that. He was insecure. Uh, look, yeah, look, we will run into each other somewhere, you know, so be truthful and tell me which bank are you going to? And I said, no, I'm not. I am resigning. I, I, I will become an actor. And after two weeks, he kind of thought that this man has gone mad. And he says, <laughs> yeah, he says, okay. 
um, I'll forward your resignation letter to the HR department. Okay. So, so it was not really like I resign and the next day, you know, I don't have an office to go to. Uh, after I resigned and my resignation got uh, accepted, I had a probation period or a, a, a like a send off period yes. or a, yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. for three notice months. Notice period that you need to give. Notice yes. period, whatever. Huh. So look, I've even forgotten the jargon. <laughs> I've been so out of it for for so long. So, so I had to work for another three months. So I remember I rely I, I resigned in July two thousand two, and I continued working till October. Uh, yeah. Yeah, something like, you know, October. And then I, I recall that in October, I had, my my notice period was to finish, but then some four days, five days later, Diwali was there. And uh, the branch that I used to work was 365 days, so there was no holiday. So uh, my boss kind of requested, can you stay till Diwali? Because, you know, most of the staff people want to take off. And I said, okay, fine, I'll do that. So I, I recall... Diwali was really the 2002 Diwali was really my last day at the work. Tell me a little about your childhood, Danish. What do you remember the most? Were you close to your mother? Were you close to your father? How did this whole uh, thing about, you know, storytelling and, you know, this whole thing that you have about you, you know, about reinventing, where did that resilience come from? Who would you attribute it uh, to, you know, in your life? And a little bit about your childhood, of course. I'd love for the listeners to know where you grew up. I grew up in Delhi. Okay. I wasn't born in Delhi because uh, in uh, at that time in families, it was normally the custom that when the girl has to deliver, they go back to their parents' house. Okay. So my grandparents, my maternal grandparents were in the village. So my mom went to the village. Where? Uh, which is UP, Ghazipur. Okay. Near Banaras and... Mm. Uh, so I was born there, but when I was just two, three months old, my mom came back to Delhi. So I've, I lived all my life in Delhi. I I grew up in a in a very uh, in a very literary kind of a background uh, atmosphere. You know, my family was replete with scholars and academicians and writers and poets and thinkers, and so. It was very normal to kind of talk in poetry and to admonish in poetry. Even when my mom would get upset with me, she would quote a Ghalib or an Iqbal or a Saadi or a Hafiz. Wow! Admonish with poetry. Yeah. That's the first time I've heard that. Wonderful. So um, we thought this is the normal way. That's what happens in everybody's house. Uh, You know, when uncles would visit and aunts would visit, there would be um, post-dinner kind of, you know, conversations happening where people Atta. are like just quoting. Yeah, mm-hmm. it's like bad bazi. Yes. Where, In Bengali, it's called the Adda, where you yeah. sit down and you discuss films. Ah, Adda bazi, yeah. Adda I mean, bazi, Adda yeah. is uh, also <laughs> yeah, called uh, in North India also. Yeah. But um, uh, particularly bad bazi, where, where you quote a couplet with a, around a particular theme and somebody has to respond by quoting a similar kind of a couplet by some other poet and it goes on till one person exhausts and cannot quote any other couplet on that theme. Okay. And I wow. remember my father and my uncle, uh, my uncle would visit from London and my father and they would like post in a sit down and it would go on to like three in the morning, four in the morning and we all would be agog. Um, so it's it was a it was a household where um, there was just too much literature, or too much philosophical discourse, or too much religious discourse. Uh, so I grew up in that kind of an atmosphere, and I thought this was really really normal thing. It only it's only when I kind of became I became a little more adult, like I realized that I live in a very unusual household. But then, you know, it was like any other middle class family. My father was an economist and he thought that there is really no value in studying Urdu or Persian or Arabic or any of these languages. And he thought really the best thing to do is to learn English and to have English education and to, uh, you know, get solid education and then go to like an IIT or a medical school or become a civil servant or go abroad. 
the usual economic insecurity that middle class has yes absolutely uh, that uh, their children should be well educated and they should make sure that they have uh, lucrative careers and they earn well enough and they don't have to feel the hardship which the generation before us uh, felt so um, even though i was growing in a in an atmosphere which had a lot of oral richness i wasn't really studying it i was studying more english thing you know english literature english books and my training was as an economist so um, so that's what it was it's only when i resigned from the bank and i became an actor i realized that um if i really want to perform well in the languages that i'm performing i need to know those languages i need to be better versed with those languages and i was performing essentially in hindi and urdu the other thing that i realized was that uh, all my 20s when i was studying and when i was working i would use english but when i started acting on stage i found it very very unnatural to act in english i did not feel Why? the connect when performing in english right, you know okay it wasn't soul language you're saying that e, yeah i mean that's a fancy term i would not use that what is a soul language soul doesn't really have a language language is a construct which you uh, which is which you have when you yeah, are born post your birth when you come out in the world and that's the construct that's the yeah. conditioning that you have Yes, but, but I, I don't do think enjoy, soul have any languages. Yeah, I do enjoy, you know, hin- uh, Hindi and I do enjoy English music. But there is a certain sort of a connection that I have with Bengali music because I was raised with that. Oh, and, so that's because uh, when you yeah. were born, that's that's the mm, conditioning you had. That's you, the conditioning. Your immediate surrounding yes. was uh, yes, Bangla. With Tagore and Bangla, and yeah. So yes, though I was raised exactly like you, you know, and English was uh, the language that my like all typical middle class parents they want your child to you know be better economically because they're so insecure and mm-hmm. uh, yeah so i completely relate to that so tell me when you moved into bombay um tell me a little bit about that you know and uh, th- you were with um, there was an estrangement with your performing partner mehmood farooqi uh, mm-hmm. how did that affect you and uh, you know when you started kisebazi um what was the leftover remnant well it was that, that uh, it was a famous feeble no case where, where where you know i stood by the girl and i i said i believe in what the girl is saying we'd like to know a little bit about well it's all over there it's it's all there in public okay. space uh, all right you just have to type feeble no case okay you will you will get everything on that and how did you feel during that time terrible terrible it's you know it's easy to stand against uh, a stranger but it's not easy to stand against someone who's a friend and a mentor yeah that must be really tough but i'm sure it strengthened you it toughened you as a person right yeah it made me i mean it, it i had to finally take a decision as to i'm only answerable to my own conscience and that's what it is so tell me something danish uh you know during this entire time of covid i mean lots of arts and especially performing art everything was completely at a standstill and how did you kind of you know keep yourself uh, not feeling crazy because there were times you know of course i really enjoyed i got writing time uh, to be alone but there were times i really really felt dejected and you know i felt the walls were closing in on me that was less but it happened so did you also feel the same way danish i recall when when i was young uh, one of my grandfathers when he would get very angry he would just he would just go and shut himself in the library and read 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 till his <laughs> anger has dissipated subsided yeah okay yeah so um, uh i i have that kind of a relationship with poetry as you know when i'm sad or when i'm when i don't really have anything or there is boredom or there's ennui what makes you sad danish well uh, like everyone else i carry existential angst jaise nida fazli ka sher hai na wo har kisi ko mukammal jahan nahi milta kahi zameen to kahi aasman to kahi aasman nahi milta so that story holds for everybody that holds for me also um and then you know as you grow old Uh, a lot of water goes under the bridge and a lot of things just accumulate and they become complicated and they become knotty and it's not easy to untie those knots 
So you just live with a lump here and a lump there. And I, I kind of distract and I kind of dive into poetry and I read more poetry and I read more books. Uh, that's really how I spend most of my time reading, memorizing poetry and reading books, all kind of books and every subject that I fancy. For me, what is important is that it's a story well told. It can be a thing about nuclear physics. It can be think about microbiology. It could be thinking things about game theory. If it is well written, if it is well told, it has my interest. And so I'm very eclectic in terms of what I read and what appeals to me. And it's fun. It's interesting because every time you open a book and if the storyteller is good, you just go on a ride to a world which is which could be anything in your imagination. Uh, and I, yeah, I, I, <laughs> I wonder how come people can get bored because yeah, that's I, very, really, very... I really don't get bored because there is so much. I'm always forever falling short of time because there is so much to do all the time. So do you enjoy being among people or do you like to be on your own most of the time? So what sort of a person are you, Danish? Let's know the person behind this amazing voice and behind all the amazing work that you do. Who are you really, Danish? I don't know. I think if you're an, if you're an actor, it's very difficult to know as to who you are because you are changing faces, masks, skins every moment, you know. Uh, the world is a uh, When you switch off the light and you lie down, who are you? I don't know. We don't, uh, I don't think we look for those answers. I think it is vanity to look for that answer as to who you are. Because Why do you say that? your whole identity is a social construct. You know, your name, your your religion, your culture, your language. It's 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 a construct, you know. You're also what language does, a, does an animal have? What, what religion yeah. does an animal have? But language what, is an amazing thing for human beings, isn't it? Yeah, that's, that's can, something yeah, we've invented. Just, so, so you know, it's the whole symbology of it, uh, the whole uh, abstraction of of all these concepts that we've created. We we all kind of float in that, but how much of that is real? That question is really really vain to ask. Who am I? I don't know. Nobody can answer that. Who they are, because whatever identities you would peg, they are not absolute identities. They are constructed. I mean, Ghalib said that long back. Hasti ke mat fareb mein par jaiyo asad Alam tamam halqa daam khayal hai Do not fall for the deception of ego asad The whole universe is nothing but a loop of your imagination's net So, you know When I listen to you, I'm just travelling into Bali Maran in Chani Chowk and I can see Ghalib's home and your voice is absolutely mesmerizing. You're also father to a young daughter, if I'm if I've got my facts right. Has mm-hmm. she also taken uh, taken on to your love for literature, for story, for poetry, for Urdu, the Zuban that you have? I mean it's No, she's just, not so young. She's twenty four. Okay. And um, yeah, she's a singer. She's a writer. Wonderful. Um, she's she she wants to learn Urdu um, right now, but I think her first language is very much English. And uh, she's an excellent writer. I think she's a better writer than me, and she's a great singer. What sort so, of music? So yes, she's, she's very much. Yeah? Uh, okay. Yeah, she's very much into the arts. Into the arts. Wonderful. So, you know what, Danish, there's no way that you can uh, get away from me today without reciting one of your favorite nazms and one poem. And uh, because I'm just melting, I'm shutting my eyes and listening to your voice and you've got the most gorgeous voice ever. And uh, so I have to listen to your favorite nazm and all our listeners will have to listen to you. So, But I I really remember my own uh, poetry. Please, please. I, okay. Mercifully, thankfully, uh, this is happening on, uh, on in an audio space so I can look at my laptop. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. So, uh, there is this poem. So, uh, so, I'm, so, I'm going to recite this one poem of mine. I'm also trying to find the English translation of that, which... My great friend, Mustansir Dalvi, the English poet, 
uh, he's very kind to me. So what he does is that when I write sometimes, I mean, I write in English also, but sometimes uh, when I uh, write a poem in Urdu, uh, Mustansir happily translates that poem for me. So that is very... Uh, kind of him to do that. Yeah. I'm sure everybody extremely do that generous. kind of work that you do. You're an amazing human being, Danish Hussain. I'm, it's such an honor. I know I'm constantly repeating that. You know, <laughs> it's, it's a pleasure to... Thank you, Mawa. Yeah, Thank you so yes. much. So we're all years waiting to hear your writing. I have my Urdu poem in front of me, but I'm also trying to find the... English translation. English translation that was translated. And I think if I go in the chat I have with Mustan Sir, the uh, Urdu, the original poem is called Tuch Tak Pohunchne Se Pehle. Tuch tak pohunchne se pehle Dur kahi maazi mein Alfaz nazm ki shakl lene se pehle Apni hi batn mein pade Teri taal pe thirakte Teri nigah unki quwat ka markaz Tere lab unki jaye muqaddas Kisi kaabe ki talash mein Kisi raks ke muntazir Ghaib hazir ke beech اپنی ہی لوح تقدیر پہ منتشر غروب اور طلوع کے بھور میں پھنسے پس و پیش کے دلدل میں دھسے یہ سوال خود سے اکثر کیا کرتے ہیں یہ مقدر ہمیں مل بھی جائے تو کیا یہ نظم اس تک پہنچ بھی جائے تو کیا یہ ساگر کوزے وچ سمٹ بھی جائے تو کیا انگلش ٹرانسلیشن Amazing. Oh, thank you. Uh, this is uh, translated by Mustansir Dalvi. And in English, the poem is called Before It Reaches You. Before it reaches you, somewhere lost in some faraway past words, even before taking the shape of verse, lie unborn in wombs. There they dance to your rhythms. Your gaze, the locus of their strength. Your lips, their hidden sanctum. They are the seek an elusive kaaba, waiting their turn to take the floor, slipping between the cracks of an absent presence. There they worry about their own fates, unable to break out of the whirlpools of dawn and dusk, sinking in the quicksand of dormancy. Time and again, they ask themselves, So what if a pot can contain the sea? So what if our destinies get manifest? So what if this poem reaches your doorstep? Thank you. My God. <laughs> I'm sure everybody, whoever will be listening to this, they are going to be so grateful that we've heard you like this. And thank you so much for being on this podcast today. Danish, I am still recovering listening to you and your voice. May you have all the bestest of the wishes from Kainat, from the universe, right there at your doorstep. And may it reach you. Thank you so very much, Danish. Shane. Thank you, Mawa. Thank you so Thank much you. for inviting me. I had a great time. Thank and you. And I hope your listeners also enjoy it. Thank you, Danish. <laughs>